I'm Senator Tim Kaine from Virginia, and today it's my pleasure to interview John Napolitano of Arlington, Virginia. It's November 10, 2014, the 239th birthday of the United States Marine Corps, and that makes it appropriate to begin, John, by saying happy birthday. Thank you very much. It, it is an exciting day, the uh, anniversary of the Corps where you served, and I'm, I'm excited to have a chance just to talk to you a little bit about your, your military career. Maybe let's just start, tell me about where you grew up and a little bit about your, your family, parents and siblings. Sure. I grew up in Rochester, New York. Uh, my father is a uh, veteran of the Vietnam era war. Mm -hmm. um, my uh, grandfather was a uh, World War II veteran and uh, from, uh, from a small age I remember always wanting to join uh, the military. And were they both Marines also? No, they were actually uh, Army draftees. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I, I was one of the first ones in the family to uh, decide to actually enlist uh, mm -hmm. on my own accord. Um, so you have brothers and sisters? I have two sisters, one uh, eight years older than me and a twin sister. And did either of them serve in the military? Uh, no, they did not. So tell, me, so tell me a little bit about your thought process as you were you know, getting to be, uh, I guess, 18 and trying to make uh, your decision about what to do and why you chose the Marines when family members had been in the Army. Well, for a long time I was on the fence between uh, the Army and the Marines and it got to the point where um, I started doing research and I realized that the Marine Corps has a, uh, a brotherhood and a history uh, like uh, no other mm -hmm. with the, uh, um, within the military service. So um, I decided that was uh, the best route to go. And did you, I mean, you know, you, you're not old enough to have been in the draft era. You're a young man. So this was a voluntary decision. Did you always, growing up uh, with the influence of your father and grandfather, just assume that you were going to join the military? I, I knew that I wanted to be in the military, even from uh, the uh, five years old and up. I remember one day I came across my father's old uniforms. Mm -hmm. And um, I was probably five, six years old, and I put them on um, and uh, came into the bedroom. And he, he saw me as he was kind of waking up. This is early yeah. in the morning. And he, he thought it, it was him growing up, just kind of waking up and realizing um, that I was wearing his uniform. Oh, wow. Wow. So that was an early memory from childhood. Yeah. Early memory. And then uh, I always remember uh, playing uh, soldiers, running through the woods with uh, friends and playing mm -hmm. G.I. Joe and everything. How old were you when you uh, when you enlisted? I was uh, 18 years old. And so you enlisted right out of high school? Correct. I uh, enlisted uh, right before uh, high school ended and mm -hmm. I left maybe about 10 or 15 days after graduation. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, did, when was that? What year? That was 2001. 2001. So this was just before 9-11. Correct. Uh, we weren't yet in the, the long period uh, where we've been engaged in, uh, in the counterterrorism struggle in such an obvious way. Um, when you enlisted out of high school, uh, I'm just curious, were other friends in your class enlisting in the military too, or was that kind of a rare thing? Uh, no, there was, uh, there was plenty of uh, classmates that were enlisting. I actually, um, actually recruited a couple of them mm -hmm. uh, into the military, and I've uh, kept in contact with, uh, with one of them, and she actually uh, spent more time in the Marines than I did, mm -hmm. uh, but she went active duty and uh, became a military police officer and then worked in other fields. And I believe she is either um, in the Marine Reserve now or actually in a National Guard unit. I see. I see. So tell me a little bit about uh, you enlist, you graduate from high school, and then you're off. Tell me a little bit about the the, the beginning training stages for an enlisted Marine in 2001. Well, it was uh, it was kind of a culture shock. <laughs> uh, I I never really grew up with uh, people screaming and yelling at me. And uh, once uh, once I got there, I you know I tried to mentally prepare and watch movies and watch shows and mm -hmm. you know, watch Full Metal Jacket. And you know even as uh, as interesting as that movie is, it's not it doesn't even feel uh, as intense as the is real life right? thing is in mm -hmm. the Marine Corps boot camp. And you did your boot camp at Paris Island? Correct. Mm -hmm. And is it, what is it, about a 10-week boot camp? Uh, it was uh, 13 weeks, actually. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so was it a completely different experience? I mean, had you done anything in your life up to that point I've that never, had prepared you for it? I, I had never been uh, pushed so hard in my life. 
uh, mentally and physically. And you know, I, I just realized I had to uh, keep, uh, keep going as uh, hard as I can and mm -hmm. uh, do my best to uh, accomplish boot camp. What was the hardest thing about boot camp? Um, I would say the hardest thing about Marine Corps boot camp is that there is a constant um, Uh, the hardest thing about Marine Corps boot camp is the constant control mm -hmm. uh, that your drill instructors have over you and everyone else mm -hmm. uh, in your platoon. Mm -hmm. I remember even at night, uh, I would wake up um, to the screaming in my ear, um, dreaming of hearing screaming from yeah. my drill instructors, and exactly. I would actually wake up from from that. So they had all control, yeah, uh, hundred percent over your body and mind mm -hmm. in boot camp. Who is the drill instructor you remember the most from your, your boot camp time? Oh, I remember all of them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it was Staff Sergeant Parton, mm -hmm. uh, Staff Sergeant Ortiz, and uh, Sergeant Alanese. And so this is like 13 years later, and you don't have any trouble remembering no, them. No, I remember them. I remember their faces. And mm -hmm. I even, to this day, sometimes I even have dreams where I'm back in boot camp. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. Or nightmares, I should say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, uh, I remember them, all of them, and... I would say uh, Sergeant Alanese was probably uh, the most interesting of mm -hmm. them all. He, uh, he, I think he was uh, what you call the hard hat, mm -hmm. um, the disciplinarian of mm -hmm. the uh, of uh, all three drill instructors. And I remember him. He had several different uh, voices. Uh, drill, mm -hmm. Marine Corps drill instructors have this uh, distinct voice that um, that they have. That's uh, kind of almost nasally mm -hmm. and yet intimidating at the same time. And he, somehow he managed to have several different uh, voices. That yeah. he, <laughs> at one time we were, we were marching mm -hmm. and all of a sudden this new one came out that was a deeper uh, evil type of yeah. voice. And it was, uh, we were like, oh my God. Like who is this? He's got a new one, yeah. <laughs> He's got a new voice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then how many folks did you go through boot camp with? Uh, well, my platoon, I believe, was about 72 uh -huh. yep. recruits. Um, as, you fi as you finished your boot camp experience, talk a little bit about the different, I guess, MOSs or w what were you assigned to do in the Marine Corps, and then I'd love to hear about your, your career as a Marine. Sure. I was a uh, infantry Marine. Mm -hmm. I was assigned to uh, India Company 3rd Battalion, 25th Marine Regiment out of Buffalo, New York. It was mm -hmm. a reserve unit. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I already knew uh, coming into boot camp that I was going to be infantry. I see. Mm -hmm. And so after boot camp finished at Parish Island, did you get assigned then to go back up to Buffalo to train, or ha where did you next go? Uh, after boot camp, you have a 10-day uh, leave, and then uh, we were sent down to um, we were sent down to Camp Pendleton uh, in San Diego. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, we were sent down to Camp Lejeune, oh, okay, North Carolina, uh, North Carolina mm -hmm. uh, for School of Infantry training, which was a uh, two-month period. Mm -hmm. um, I have a son who's an infantry officer who's at Lejeune now. Oh, great. And uh, I, they probably don't get yelled at quite as much, but they get yelled at a lot, <laughs> you know, as they're going through their training. So some of what you're saying is ringing a bell. And he just took command of his first uh, platoon down oh, at great. Lejeune. So after your, after your training there, your infantry training, wh what did you next do? After uh, we finished our infantry training, um, I should say that there are uh, several Marines from my reserve unit actually went through boot camp with I me see. as well. So we mm -hmm. actually went through boot camp together and then we went through uh, school of infantry training together as mm -hmm. well. And then after that, uh, we went uh, back to Buffalo uh, for our first drill weekend. It just happened to be that our first drill weekend was the day after we graduated from School of Infantry training, so oh, we were wow. essentially thrown right into it. Mm -hmm. Yep. And like, do you remember what time of year that was? Was it, you know, you're, you're doing drill training in horrible weather or good weather? Or? Nope, it was horrible weather. It was, <laughs> uh, I believe it was December 2nd when we were, Is that right? uh, wow. when we graduated and we were in that uh, um, drill weekend. So mm -hmm. I believe I, I, we went to the field a little bit that weekend and uh, got to experience buffalo snow, mm -hmm. uh, buffalo cold. It, you know, one of the things that my son tells me is he's kind of always amazed at the amount of training and how mm -hmm. thorough the training is. I mean, did you have that feeling during your time in the Marine Corps that the training was pretty intense, but, uh, but that that was a good thing? It was. It was, uh, it was definitely intense. Um, 
a lot of the classes uh, through boot camp and School of Infantry were very long. Um, mm -hmm. When you think of a long class, it's you know, eight, ten hours long. Mm -hmm. um, you take a break for lunch uh, and you come back and you go for, um, to dinner and then you come back yeah. for uh, uh, some of these classes. So they're very long and intense. Mm -hmm. um, and then the tra training never ends. Uh, we get we got to our unit in Buffalo, and we uh, were training, mm -hmm. always yep. training. Um, it, it, and it's kind of a multiple challenge. You have the physical challenge, you have the, the sort of intellectual mental challenge of the training, and then you kind of have the, the psychological stress challenge of learning to deal with the stress of being yelled at or having a whole bunch of material thrown at you or having an eight-hour course, and you're trying to basically train in all of these areas, you know, learning, bringing your physical self up to its best, but also learning how to deal with some pretty intense stress. Exactly. Um, so after you then uh, did that drill uh, training in Buffalo, what was next? Uh, after that, it was, uh, uh, after I started uh, school. I started school in uh, SUNY Brockport, mm -hmm. and I was going for a uh, history degree and a criminal justice minor. Mm -hmm. And then you were in a reserve status at this point. So, Correct. how long were you in reserve? And and tell me about you know getting called up to active, and let's you know kind of find out how that works. Uh, we were in reserve status uh, for several years. In uh, 2003, the Iraq War began, and uh, we were our unit was on uh, kind of on notice. Mm -hmm. uh, there was. Other reserve units, even in New York, were called uh, for active duty and sent uh, mm -hmm. for the invasion. Uh, however, our unit was not. And uh, in 2000, uh, mid 2004, we started hearing rumors that we were going to be activated for uh, 2005. Mm -hmm. And it, they finally uh, let us know okay, it's coming uh, in January 2005, expect a call uh, for um, activation. Mm -hmm. During the time before you were activated, you were doing training, and was that like a couple weekends or you know a couple weeks during the summer? What was the sure. the basic training schedule like when you're in reserve status? Reserve status is uh, one week in a month and generally two weeks uh, a year. Mm -hmm. uh, usually that falls in summer. Um, it doesn't always fall in uh, summer for training, but I believe they probably try to do that because they know many reservists go to uh, college. Mm -hmm. uh, so. We we did spend time uh, going to we did spend time going to California and mm -hmm. the uh, Mojave Desert. Mm -hmm. Is that like twenty nine Palms? Twenty nine Palms, yeah, California. Sure. Mm -hmm. And we did uh, training there, and it was very interesting. We we knew that the Iraq War was happening. Uh, Afghanistan uh, had already um, the Afghanistan War had been going for a while, and our training was still focused on Cold War tactics. Mm. Our units go get online yeah. and we push and then we attack uh, the uh, set up, uh, mm -hmm. pop up uh, dummies that they had set up on, on the fields yeah. of uh, the desert. Mm -hmm. So it was very interesting and some of us kind of wondered why are we doing this when um, you know, fighting is shifting to more yeah. urban status. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until we uh, went back to Twenty-nine palms for our uh, two-month workup uh, to go before we went to Iraq. Uh, that we start concentrating more on urban uh, fighting and urban urban con combat tactics. Now, did you? So you about January of '05, you were notified. Okay, you, you, the unit will be activated. And was that the point where you went back to Twenty-nine Palms to do more of the the two-month workup? That's correct. Mm -hmm. uh, January, we uh, reserved, received our orders for uh, activation mm -hmm. and we decided, I'm sorry, um, in January we received our orders for activation and uh, shortly after we uh, were flown to 29 Palms, California uh, for our uh, two month workup. Mm -hmm. And here we concentrated on urban, uh, urban combat training. They had set up uh, several, uh, like a little town with um, uh, shipping containers mm -hmm. stacked yeah. on top of yeah, each I've other. Yeah, I've seen these, right, sure. And uh, that was uh, that was really good training. We learned <coughs> mm -hmm. how to clear uh, buildings. We did force on force with other uh, platoons in our mm -hmm. company. And uh, I believe one of our final training um, 
projects, we went to a, a, an abandoned Air Force base mm -hmm. uh, somewhere else in California, and they used the uh, abandoned uh, officer housing units mm -hmm. Hmm. as a uh, essentially as a mock Iraqi town. I see. With uh, several uh, many Marines, active duty Marines that had are already been through Iraq um, and deployed there, they they were essentially our um, mock instructors. Mm -hmm. Some of them uh, played Iraqis, mm -hmm. and we would have to search them. We would have to search vehicles. We would do uh, combat patrols. Um, and one of the, I think one of the uh, most fun. Uh, Train activities is we followed a uh, Abrams tank, mm -hmm. and that yep. was a good time. Yeah, um, and <laughs> trying to stay away from yeah, uh, right. Uh, stay uh, stay away from the uh, exhaust behind yeah. it, but uh, it was a good time. They actually let us uh, uh, jump into the uh, crew cabin, mm -hmm. uh, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And so that um, now, when you say that you were doing this training, some of the force on force training with other platoons in your company, were the, were some of the other platoons? Reserve platoons and some were active and some were guard. Was it a mixture or was or was this all reserve? Platoons this was all together? reserve. Unit. Our mm -hmm. our unit, uh, the battalion, uh, was activated. Uh, I see. All together, mm -hmm. and then all the companies went to Twenty Nine Palms together, and mm -hmm. trained. We, we generally trained uh, within our company and with our within our own platoons. Mm -hmm. uh, but once we were sent to this one town in California in this Air Force base, uh, the entire battalion was set in this town and we would I see. Uh, do combat uh, All together. training. Mm -hmm. when did, then when did you go to Iraq first? Uh, we reached Iraq in uh, March 2005. Mm -hmm. And then how long were you there with your platoon? We were there till uh, late September. And let me jump ahead kind of to the end. Um, was that your only deployment or did you have other deployments? That was my only deployment. So March to September, so that was about a uh, six-month deployment. Mm -hmm. And was that kind of standard at the time, that, you know, that the uh, that Army deployments in Iraq would be about six months long? Well, uh, Marine Corps does... I'm uh, sorry, yeah. Marine, yeah, I, obviously. So <laughs> Marine Corps deployments uh, are roughly nine months long. Okay. Uh, about two to three months of a training workup I and see. then six months in country. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe Army deployments at the time were 18-month uh, uh -huh. uh, deployments where they would, I believe they would have a six-month workup and yeah. then nine months a or whatever the or rest something. is mm -hmm. uh, in country. Tell me, uh, where were you in Iraq during that uh, during the six months that you were there? When we, were, when we first arrived, we were in uh, El Assad Air Base. Mm -hmm. And we are That's the kind of main air base that's not too far from Baghdad, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's, I believe it's the largest air base in uh, at least uh, Anabar province. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we flew into El Assad, and our company was tasked with uh, perimeter security uh, for several months. Mm -hmm. uh, while there, we would uh, man the towers along the uh, perimeter fence line of the base, mm -hmm. and uh, we also. Uh, helped build uh, fortifications at these uh, along the perimeter with mm -hmm. uh, sandbags. So that's an uh, that was probably one of the busiest airports in the world during that period of time. Exactly, we yeah. saw fighter jets coming in and out all the time. Uh, the C five uh, cargo planes coming mm -hmm. through is is pretty remarkable. To see everything coming in and out. Yeah, yeah. I think I've landed there once in a maybe a C one thirty, but. They were doing these corkscrew landing mm -hmm. patterns where they would just kind of spiral down, and it was a it was a pretty intense landing experience. I'd never experienced one like it, but it was a busy, busy place. It was. Um, so, and how long were you there, and then what did you ne do next after you moved away from the airbase? I believe we were in the airbase for about three and a half, four months, uh, doing perimeter security, mm -hmm. and then uh, at one point we were sent on a uh, operation called Operation Riverwalk, mm -hmm. which was meant to clear uh, the Euphrates. Uh, river uh, shoreline of uh, any IEDs and uh, in search of any uh, ca uh, weapons caches. Mm -hmm. And just for folks who are listening to this, talk a little bit about the geography. So, is the Euphrates River Valley? Is it you know right in Baghdad or near Baghdad or where where was this in the country? I'm trying to remember. Um, <laughs> I, I actually cradle of so civilization. That's yeah. all I remember. Mm -hmm. uh, the Euphrates uh, River. Um, like was it real far from the airbase? I mean, was it a? I believe it was uh, probably a two-hour drive mm -hmm. through convoy mm -hmm. um, to the river. Uh, but they had uh, they had uh, many issues uh, with uh, 
insurgents using the uh, the rivers, mm -hmm. using um, uh, setting up uh, explosives, IEDs along uh, alongside the uh, the river, mm -hmm. and uh, launching mortars and rockets from the river uh, towards uh, the air base and other. Uh, operating bases that the military was operating at the time. And so that was the purpose of this mission was to try to remove that as a, th as a threat to whether it was the air base or other U.S. interests there. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, so our entire, uh, I believe our entire company was sent um, along this uh, river walk where we got online and we essentially just walked through looking for weapons cache, mm -hmm. uh, caches. Um, and that was really where we uh, first met um, Iraqis. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually uh, worked with uh, Iraqi soldiers for the first time mm -hmm. on this operation and uh, got to learn a little bit from them and who they were, mm -hmm. uh, what their motivations were, and then we also met some Iraqis along the way, uh, mm -hmm. Iraqi civilians. Mm -hmm. um, it was very interesting. We learned that, um, you know, they're not Many of them are, are not bad people. They're, sure. um, they had a great history, a great culture. Uh, many of them were really generous. Mm -hmm. I remember one day uh, we had visited one house. We um, checked the yard, made sure that there was no um, there was no weapon caches mm -hmm. in the area. Um, interviewed their uh, the father mm -hmm. um, and uh, talked to some of the children. We would give out candy yeah. and some of the MRE scraps that we didn't want yeah. to the kids <laughs> and mm -hmm. the families. And I remember we uh, had to set up uh, our bivouac for the night, and our um, this uh, Iraqi family started chasing our squad down with bread and apples to give to us. Is so, that right? wow. so gracious uh, that we were there. Wow! Um, and I, I just remember how you know how interesting and amazing it was to mm -hmm. uh, to um, hear you know learn from these people and. and have a chance to uh, meet them. Mm -hmm. How how long was this particular operation? Was it a week, a couple weeks, or it was? Uh, it was uh, I believe it was six or seven days mm -hmm. um, long. And setting up different camps each night as you're moving along the river valley. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, we would just uh, pretty much set up a tent for the uh, command post, and then uh, all the Marines just sleep outside, sleep <laughs> on the ground, sleep yeah. on the ground. Mm -hmm. how, w during the time you were doing the. Uh, uh, Security at the air base. Were you ever under fire, under attack, or, or no? Uh, I, I don't believe we ever took any small arms fire. Mm -hmm. um, at least not not any uh, uh, posts that I was at. Yeah. Uh, but there were several times that we did receive uh, rockets mm -hmm. and uh, mortars. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember one night uh, we started receiving, I believe, mortar fire. Maybe, maybe it was rocket fire. And one rocket hit probably about 200 meters away from my. Mm -hmm. um, from my uh, tower that mm -hmm. I was in, and that was kind of a wake-up call. Yeah, uh, wow. You know, the, things and are do you, real. And do you and when when something like that happens, I mean, do you have a lot of advance notice? I mean, do you see it? Do you hear it? I mean, it's at night, so sometimes we can. I believe I remember seeing sometimes the streaks. Yeah. Of mm -hmm. uh, the rockets firing in the distance, and you could see them, and then they start coming in, yeah. and the uh, air raid sirens uh, start coming on. Mm -hmm. And then, how about when you were doing this Operation Riverwalk? Did you encounter hostilities, fire? Did you find a lot of weapons caches? I mean, talk a little bit about that. Um, we, I, I believe, our company did find uh, several weapons caches mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, while we were there. There was one night where uh, my squad was tasked for, to do a uh, um, night patrol mm -hmm. uh, while the rest of the uh, company slept. So we were doing a just a security patrol around the perimeter mm -hmm. and we were uh, walking along the river and we actually heard a couple of motor boats from the other side of the river uh, coming across very slowly uh, to our shoreline. Hmm. And you couldn't see them, you could, you could hear them before you saw them? We could hear them. Um, mm -hmm. I don't believe I had uh, night vision goggles at the time. Mm -hmm. um, I was a uh, machine gunner mm -hmm. and I didn't have any uh, the night vision goggles or you know, with the Marine Corps, it's it's always spare parts yeah. uh, with everything. But mm -hmm. um, several several of the uh, members of our squad had a uh, had night vision goggles, so they were training in. Our uh, sergeant put us uh, in a um, position um, mm -hmm. to uh, to attack in case uh, we identified weapons. And it got to a point where we were trying to get a uh, a sniper to uh, let us know if we were clear uh, to. Uh, shoot at these mm -hmm. boats um, because and 
two in the morning, you're up to no good if you're yeah, right. riding across a river in a motorboat. Especially if you're going slow and you're trying to not be too loud, there's something's going on. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So we, we didn't uh, know what was going on, but I remember uh, setting my machine gun down, uh, training in on these uh, boats and taking the safety off the weapon mm -hmm. and realizing that we might end up shooting these guys. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, it was very intense for, uh, you know, probably a couple of minutes yeah. that we were waiting. And I don't believe my sergeant could ever get a, uh, call from command, um, to, um, uh, fire on these boats. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it was just a mix of communications. Mm -hmm. So we decided to, uh, he popped, uh, a flare, mm -hmm. um, through a grenade launcher up. And these guys took off. Yeah. So once they, they took was off, illuminated they and they knew they'd been seen. So and he said, "Let's go. Let's let's um, chase them down." So we mm -hmm. we got up. We started chasing them in line uh, along the river, shooting up flares mm -hmm. uh, over and over until these guys just took off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think the intent was also if we were to pop a flare up, if they were to start firing, then we would have yeah. our permission You're at that little, point yeah. to defend ourselves. Uh, but these guys realized that the jig was up and yeah, that they, they, were out, they had they no were chance. Outmatched. So they, they took off and mm -hmm. uh, that was the uh, closest at that point we had to uh, mm -hmm. uh, firing back. How about after this Riverwalk operation, what else did you do during the time you were in Iraq? After, after that, uh, we got word that the city of Hit uh, was being cleared out by our battalion mm -hmm. and some active duty units. Um, I believe what happened is after the Marines cleared out um, the insurgents in Fallujah mm -hmm. in November 2004. Right. Uh, yeah, ten, many year, these, ten years ago. Exactly. Uh, today, I think. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. They were fighting uh, on Marine Corps birthday. Mm -hmm. After they cleared out uh, the insurgents out of Fallujah, most of those insur insurgents uh, went to the city of Hit and were operating pretty much freely. And mm -hmm. It was like the Wild West there. So uh, word came down that our battalion was going to clear the city of Hit and set up uh, several forward operating bases in the city itself. And uh, our company uh, went in there after uh, they, uh, the other Marines cleared out this city. Mm -hmm. And we set up a forward operating base and uh, started setting up combat patrols, uh, recon patrols, mm -hmm. um, security uh, patrols, checking houses uh, for weapons cache, caches and uh, just talking to some of the locals. Mm -hmm. uh, it was also a uh, hearts and mind mission as yeah, well. Right. Um, I believe they were setting up, uh, trying to rebuild the infrastructure of uh, this city, mm -hmm. setting it up with generators so it can have consistent power. Uh, we also, on, on many patrols, we would load out with candy and yeah. <laughs> candy and bullets pretty much wow. and some toys. Wow. And uh, a lot of times we would go and we would see these uh, kids and we'd give them candy and soccer balls mm -hmm. and uh, stuffed animals um, as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how long were you in the, in the city? We were in uh, the city of Hit for, uh, I believe, two months, mm -hmm. two and a half months. Mm -hmm. And uh, here is, uh, in the city is actually when um, we were involved in actual uh, combat and mm -hmm. uh, several firefights. Mm -hmm. And tell, tell me a little bit about those. I mean, sure. was it, they tended to be kind of at night or how would, how would they happen? Uh, some of them would be at night. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of our uh, particular uh, instances, we, our squad uh, was supposed to go on patrol one morning and our uh, Iraqi uh, army contingent mm -hmm. that was supposed to work with us mm -hmm. um, on this patrol never showed up. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we kind of thought this was uh, a little strange, actually, because uh, every patrol we would have to go out with Iraqi soldiers and yeah. you know, train them and work with them. And these guys never showed up. Uh, and so we decided to go on our patrol alone as a squad. And for the most part, the uh, patrol went really well. Uh, we walked around and uh, on our designated route, and we came up to uh, one of the main avenues of this city. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, um, we got into this intersection and we looked both ways up and down uh, the street and it was abandoned. Mm -hmm. Nobody was on the street. And were you all on foot or were there some on we're foot, some on, on vehicles all on foot? We were yeah. all on foot. Mm -hmm. And at this intersection we realized this entire, uh, uh, for blocks and going each way, there was no, no uh, Iraqis mm -hmm. in sight. Mm -hmm. And we knew we were in trouble at that mm -hmm. point. Yeah. 
and our uh, our squad was uh, supposed to finish up uh, and walk down the main mm -hmm. uh, main road right back to our uh, Ford operating base. Mm -hmm. But my squad leader realized that if we do that, um, it could be a death sentence yeah. for us. Most mm -hmm. likely they've daisy chained uh, several IEDs mm -hmm. down this main road and that was the whole point of evacuating the, all the civilians. Yeah. They all knew what was going on. So um, we decided to go into an alleyway instead mm -hmm. and um, uh, walk around the, uh, the main road and get back to the mm -hmm. Fort Opera base. Uh, so we went into this alleyway and we um, walked path, past this large uh, pile of rocks mm -hmm. and uh, you know, our point man walked right over, uh, right on top of the rocks. Uh, I was on the opposite side of where this pile of rocks were. Mm -hmm. and So it was on one side of the alley and you were kind of on the other side of the alley. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And as we're walking by it, um, just about uh, once the squad hit, uh, the middle of the squad hit the a uh, pile of rocks, mm -hmm. it exploded. Mm -hmm. And uh, the IED went off, and all I remember is hearing a loud explosion. Mm -hmm. I looked to my left, and I saw just a pile, uh, I saw just a, a cloud of smoke rushing mm -hmm. towards me. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I heard my uh, squad leader say, hey, uh, you know, get, a, get in front of the, uh, of the alley, uh, post security. Mm -hmm. And I remember seeing um, one of our uh, fire team leaders running out of the smoke, mm -hmm. um, and uh, he was injured. Mm -hmm. uh, got covered from uh, the back uh, down to his uh, ankles mm -hmm. in shrapnel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then uh, one of our one of other, our other um, squad members, um, unfortunately, took the uh, full brunt mm. uh, front. Mm -hmm. of the IED going off mm. and uh, he was just covered head and toe with shrapnel, a shrapnel. Mm -hmm. and I just remember seeing uh, him covered in blood mm -hmm. and I mean there is when it when it really got real yeah but. how many did you guys have a lot of casualties and injuries from that uh, I believe we had uh, four casualties. Mm -hmm. uh, thankfully nobody was killed. Yeah, that uh, is, thank God for that. One of our uh, squad members um, he reacted quickly and put a uh, tourniquet on the mm -hmm. uh, most injured Marine. Mm -hmm. Our, we, ha we actually had a corpsman with us, mm -hmm. and he was right next to the blast as yeah. well, and he actually suffered a, uh, a concussion, which mm -hmm. was, I think, his second or third one. Wow. So he was just out of it, and mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, he, he um, wasn't able to yeah. help um, with the medical, uh, providing uh, medical aid to uh, these injured Marines. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I believe it was four altogether that got hurt. One of my buddies uh, who was at the back of the uh, um, squad mm -hmm. in the formation, he actually got a piece of shrapnel that went uh, through his uh, kneecap mm -hmm. and it went through the skin of the kneecap and right out. And if, he, if his knee had been an inch forward, mm -hmm. his knee would have been completely crippled. You mean so it kind of, it all just kind hit of like right the skin through the flap skin. right through the exactly. front. Exactly. Wow. Wow. Uh, he was very mm -hmm. lucky. How, then how did you guys get out of that situation? So you're in an alley. There's just been an IED that's up. You can't go out on the main road because that's all. Exactly. Ha, so what happened? Uh, at that point, um, we provided um, aid to uh, the mm -hmm. injured Marine and set up uh, security. And uh, our squad leader um, had the radio man call in for uh, the uh, quick reaction force mm -hmm. to come and uh, pick us up. The quick mm -hmm. reaction force were in... Uh, Amtrak armored vehicles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so they, uh, you know, if there would be any problems, they, you know, they would be protected um, while they come mm -hmm. and get us. Yep. So they they ended up coming and uh, getting getting us. Our uh, squad leader um, ran around the corner of this uh, alleyway mm -hmm. um, to see if he can find the trigger man, mm -hmm. and he ended up finding uh, one man that was just kind of. It, uh, he was just uh, hanging out in his kitchen, mm -hmm. and uh, it was just—it was somewhat suspect that he was just standing around while then every Everything everywhere else was going was, crazy. Yeah. Exactly, mm -hmm. and uh, so we we ended up grabbing him and uh, handcuffing him, detaining him, and taking him back to the base when we were um, when they medevac the other mm -hmm. injured Marines. Mm -hmm. um, but to this day, I have no idea if he really was a trigger man yeah. or not. 
were you, um, so during that time that you were in HIT, were you in other kind of active firefight situations? Was it, were that the most intense? Uh, no, we, uh, we were in uh, another situation one day. Uh, this was actually probably two, three weeks before we were leaving the city and mm -hmm. to leave Iraq completely. Yeah. Um, uh, my squad was on a quick reaction force detail. Uh, we were actually going to go resupply uh, one of our own uh, other forward operating bases in the town mm -hmm. um, with uh, some meals and drinks and things like that. And I remember waiting. We were waiting to uh, leave, and I kind of I walked out um, in front of the barriers to hear, uh, just to kind of see, um, check out the city. Mm -hmm. And I remember having my helmet in my hand, my flak vest, and a uh, machine gun on top mm -hmm. of me. And then all of a sudden, I started hearing uh, the machine guns on our roof mm -hmm. um, starting to fire out. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, so I went out. I went beyond the barriers. <laughs> I'm looking around. Like, what's going on? Mm -hmm. We, you know, sometimes we um, we would fire at. Um, you know, some fixed positions um, mm -hmm. outside of the city uh, for training purposes. Yep. We would mm -hmm. set up like an old truck or something yeah. like that and Way shoot out. at. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So I figured, okay, well, maybe they're doing that. Um, so I'm looking out and just kind of seeing what's going on. And I heard, uh, all of a sudden, I started hearing the distinct sound mm -hmm. of the uh, coming in. incoming bullets, mm -hmm. uh, machine guns, everything coming at them. And then I realized, oh, I'm being shot <laughs> yeah. at. Uh, so um, I, I ran behind the uh, barrier. Mm -hmm. And then I heard uh, a whistle um, of an incoming RPG, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it shot right over our base. Mm. And um, I remember uh, this uh, guy, uh, this other Marine who had come just that day, mm -hmm. and I found out later um, that he it was his first time out of the wire uh -huh. <laughs> of, uh, wow. of safety uh, in a mm -hmm. different... Uh, from the air base, he had come there and he screamed, incoming, yeah. and just like dove onto the ground yeah. and grabbed a, several of the Marines in our squad and just pulled like them pulled them down to the ground and that's when our RPG hit our building. Mm -hmm. And I realized, oh, I better put my helmet on. This is getting yeah. real. <laughs> <laughs> so threw my uh -huh. helmet on and I hear my sergeant say, get up to the roof. Yeah. Uh, it was a flat rooftop where we mm -hmm. had our... Um, and the Marines up there uh, providing uh, fortified security. Then uh, there was a a little bit of a lip on top of the roof where mm -hmm. you could uh, set your weapon down and have a little bit of cover while you uh, fired back. So we started running up this building, which is a converted school. So it was mm -hmm. a three-story building. We were on the bottom. And we started running up. We got up to the uh, second floor. And I was exhausted at this point. Yeah. I, mean, I have uh, uh, Both exhausted 20, and 20 and pound machine gun going on at me. the same time. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, 100 mm -hmm. pounds worth of gear on me. Mm -hmm. We were running up the stairs as fast as we can. And I heard this explosion. I heard this explosion, and I look behind me, and uh, a window that was covered in um, sandbags mm -hmm. just exploded. Mm -hmm. It exploded right, um, right before my eyes. Like, and I thought an RPG had hit the uh, mm -hmm. window and just mm -hmm. took it out. We actually had a ping pong table right there. Mm -hmm. Sandbags crushed it. Mm -hmm. Wow! <laughs> so yeah. our only source of uh, entertainment, <laughs> entertainment was, was gone. gone. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we. Um, <clears throat> so. I saw this explosion, I saw the uh, sandbags fly, and all of a sudden I just felt this force knock me down and mm -hmm. knocked every Marine down. Uh, what it ended up being was uh, two suicide uh, vehicles hmm. right outside of the uh, uh, entry control point mm -hmm. gate exploded mm -hmm. right there. And the force of it, of both those cars exploding, um, took out all the sandbags uh, wow. along the front of the building and wow. knocked everyone out, mm -hmm. knocked everyone down, I should say. and. <clears throat> um, so for a moment, you know, got it behind some walls mm -hmm. just in case there was anything else yeah, coming right. in. And I hear my sergeant again say, get, get up to the roof. <laughs> I'm like, do we really have to? Yeah. <laughs> so we, start, uh, we got up to the roof, and I just mm -hmm. remember um, thinking, this isn't happening. This isn't mm -hmm. happening. Uh, what, you know, uh, this feels almost like a video game. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it just yeah, doesn't surreal. feel real. It feels like mm -hmm. a movie. And I was wondering, is there anyone left alive on top mm -hmm. of the roof? And we get up uh, through the door, and I just think, like, am I going to get shot you, by a straight yeah, bullet you, coming through this open right, door? Right. And it's just a cloud of smoke so on the can't roof. Even tell Don't what's even there. know, yeah, who's there, what's left. And we uh, <clears throat> we get past the cloud of smoke. We get to um, the edge of the roof, mm -hmm. and we just start uh, laying down suppress a fire. Mm -hmm. And this was a huge coordinated attack. Mm -hmm. And um, what we found out earlier, uh, later. 
uh, what we found out later was that uh, this was essentially just uh, insurgents that kind of uh, roamed mm-hmm. um, roamed through Iraq mm-hmm. and attacked towns. Oh, I see. It's like a traveling circus of uh, So it wasn't even just hit-based people. They no. were just com- coming. They were coming through. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We had um, RPGs, rockets, mortars, mm-hmm. um, machine guns, uh, small arms firing at us. People are driving by, mm-hmm. um, shooting out the windows of their cars yeah. at us from all angles. Mm-hmm. And um, and the the firefight lasted probably about forty forty five minutes. Hmm. Hmm. Um, With you on the roof, pretty much the whole time. Once you got up there, that's where you stayed. Exactly. Mm-hmm. We were on the roof um, for about forty minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, and at that point, uh, I think we finally got air cover. Mm-hmm. Um, the Cobras uh, flew over and took out I think some positions, and mm-hmm. they were and uh, these insurgents withdrew. Mm-hmm. And we actually had a squad on patrol in the city that mm-hmm. were that was ambushed, and uh, thankfully none of them were uh, injured mm-hmm. uh, from this ambush. But insurgents were firing down on them from rooftops, mm-hmm. and they they told me afterwards that they actually had seen an ambulance set up, and they they wonder what was going on with mm-hmm. this ambulance. And shortly after, then they were attacked, and our base was attacked. I see. These insurgents had their own uh, ambulance and mm-hmm. uh, medevac mm-hmm. set up, For them, yeah. very well um, coordinated. Mm-hmm. And after the uh, firefight, uh, a couple hours later, our squad was sent out um, to look for evidence, bodies, mm-hmm. ammunition. Everything was cleaned up. Wow! They, wow. they did a they great job pros. cleaning up and evacuating mm-hmm. and getting out of there. Did you then leave HIT a couple weeks later, and that was the end of your deployment in Iraq? A couple weeks later, we ended up leaving. Mm-hmm. Um, we had done a, a couple of uh, smaller operations. Uh, there were a couple of large, uh, tall uh, apartment buildings mm-hmm. pretty much right across from our uh, base, mm-hmm. and they had been firing at us, too, at several yeah, points. Mm-hmm. So we did a uh, uh, an operation uh, where uh, we set up security on one of the buildings, and then uh, Marines went through and cleared the other building that mm-hmm. was um, uh, where most of the trouble was coming from. And they ended up finding large uh, weapon caches. So that meant when you left, the next guys who were following you at that base wouldn't be under the same jeopardy from those exactly. positions. Yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Uh, they ended up, uh, so we, we ended up clearing out. And uh, our last night there, we received a couple of incoming mortar mm-hmm. rounds uh, to say goodbye to us, I guess. Yeah. And we <laughs> took off. And when you took off, did you go back to the base, uh, the air base for a while, or did you come home? No, we went back to the air base for, mm-hmm. uh, I believe it was about a week or so, mm-hmm. um, I think filling out paperwork, uh, taking your uh, post-deployment uh, yeah. classes. And then from there, we uh, went to uh, Camp Lejeune, mm-hmm. uh, I believe, for another week, mm-hmm. uh, where we did more paperwork, yeah. more <laughs> classes, um, and, uh, and then uh, finally went home from there. How, when you got home, how long did you stay in the Marines? I mean, did you stay as a reservist or did you have other, you didn't deploy back to Iraq, did you have other activation periods during your time with the Marines? Uh, after I got back, uh, I finished up my degree. Mm-hmm. And from there, um, I decided uh, to move to Washington, D.C. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, uh, one of my friends was a uh, police officer uh, down here mm-hmm. in D.C. and I decided, well, I have nothing else going on right now. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, want, might as well go down to D.C. and check it out, become a police officer for mm-hmm. a w- little while and see if I like it and if I want to stay here or go back up to Rochester someday. Mm-hmm. And I, um, so I came down in September 2006 and joined the D.C. Police Department. Mm-hmm. And uh, while I was in the police academy, I started uh, taking photos and videos of uh, our class training. Right. Um, you know, while we're at the range and doing PT and uh, uh, doing like uh, defensive tactics, I would mm-hmm. take photos and videos of us. And at the end of the uh, academy class, I decided to uh, make a, a video with a couple of buddies uh, mm-hmm. from our class and uh, show show this at our graduation to the mm-hmm. families uh, that came down. And I realized at that point that I really enjoyed mm-hmm. uh, taking mm-hmm. photos, videos, and that I. Um, didn't really enjoy being a cop as much. So yeah. after a few months on the streets of D.C., mm-hmm. I decided, all right, I think 
uh, I think it's time to make a, uh, a career shift, mm -hmm. and I went back to uh, school, in the film school in the Police Department. And, and that's what you do now? And that's what I do now. In uh, 2007, I mm -hmm. left the Marine Reserve. My contract was up, and uh, I decided uh, it was time to um, move on from that and, and try new things. And so you do videography work, and you're still here in the D.C. area? I, I do. Um, mm -hmm. uh, well, I was in, uh, well, I was finishing up my uh, master's um, degree at American University. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, uh, I believe it was May 1st, May 2nd. Um, 2011 and uh, President Obama came on uh, the air and he uh, said a message uh, that uh, Osama bin Laden had been killed. Yeah. Mm. And that the next day I uh, decided I, I just kind of wanted to celebrate. It was, you know, such mm -hmm. a um, uh, su such an achievement for our oh, country yeah. as mm -hmm. well as uh, you know something that consumed you know most of my adult life yeah. and mm -hmm. shaped it. Uh, so I decided to go down to uh, American Legion Post 24 uh, mm -hmm. that I was a recent member of, and mm -hmm. uh, I was I was there. I was uh, having a couple of beers uh, with. Uh, this is the post that's in Old Town Alexandria. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I, I went there, and I uh, I started talking with uh, a, a friend of mine, or I, talk, I started talking to a stranger. And I find out that it's the uh, commander of the post. Mm -hmm. and I said to him, <clears throat> you know, I think it would be really interesting if we do a uh, if we start filming. Uh, some of these veterans here. Sounds like we have so many amazing stories. Yeah, we should mm. start um, interviewing them. I'm a filmmaker. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so he thought it was a great idea. He really loved the idea, and uh, we started getting a few different people together. Uh, one of my buddies who lives down here, uh, who's in my squad in Iraq, he uh, he helped me out, interviewed uh, mm -hmm. with me, as well as um, a couple of World War II veterans and a uh, Vietnam veteran, mm -hmm. and we created this uh, little web series uh, called The Heroes of Post 24. For, wow. Um, Post, for American Legion Post 24. And so you, you did for the Post what the Library of Congress is doing for the nation with exactly. this interview project. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And what I wanted to really do, too, is uh, create short documentaries, four or five mm -hmm. minutes long, uh, add stock footage, uh, sound effects, music, and mm -hmm. just kind of make it something nice that somebody could watch um, and, you know, and, and just learn uh, yeah. a nice little story mm -hmm. about a veteran. So you, uh, let me ask you this, how, how closely do you stay in touch with people that you served with? Uh, you know, we, we actually have a Facebook page mm -hmm. uh, for our unit. Um, I know s several times now that they have, uh, they've gotten together, uh, I think just a couple weekends ago they had gotten together. And mm -hmm. I know tonight they're getting together in Buffalo for yeah. uh, um, pre, pre a couple bars and, yeah. and birthday for the Marines. Birthday. Yeah. I think right. that's the biggest. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So they get together a lot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, unfortunately, being down in uh, Buffalo, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, being down in D.C., it's a little bit harder mm -hmm. uh, to make my way up there. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was actually just um, just a few years ago. Unfortunately, uh, one of our uh, platoon members uh, was killed in a motorcycle accident. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the loss of life is terrible, but it was a, also a big deal because he he was the one who saved our uh, entire company, mm -hmm. all our lives. Uh, that day in HIT when our base was being mm -hmm. attacked, he saw these vehicles mm -hmm. uh, approaching the control point, entry control point, and he shot and killed the drivers. I see, before the blast. And then they, they detonated. So, so they could have detonated closer to things. And exactly. If, worse, yeah. if, he, if he didn't have the quick thinking... The bill, and if you didn't have the quick thinking, and um, was able to take out those vehicles, and if they came in um, right next to our base, they would have brought the entire building down. Mm -hmm. And there was over 120 Marines, Marines in that there. base wow. at that time. So wow. he saved all our lives. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was even yeah, such a bigger really tragedy tough. that um, mm -hmm. he was killed in a motorcycle accident just a few years later. Mm -hmm. But um, it was nice. We ended up, uh, you know, we, uh, many of us came back to town. Some, one of them drove from Texas mm -hmm. through All the night just to get wow. there. Wow. Um, and I drove up as well. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, it was great to see everyone. We had a nice little uh, memorial service and mm -hmm. dinner. Um, seeing even my old commander and, and then joking with some of the other guys mm -hmm. and everything. And, mm -hmm. you know, it just felt like, I don't know, it just felt like things didn't change. You know, it just mm -hmm. yeah. felt like it was just uh, the same. You back know, hanging out back with together guys. as if it were yesterday. Exactly. So you grew up in a household where this was something that you thought about doing, that you wanted to enlist in the military, and now you're at the, you know, years later at the back end, you're, you're a veteran. Mm -hmm. You know, could you have imagined what it would have been like? Was it 
No. You know, would you do the same thing all over again if you were a 13 or 14 year old <laughs> in high school? I would definitely, um, I would definitely do it. Uh, if I had what I know now, I would yeah. definitely do it again. Uh, I think I would probably prepare myself a little bit more, mm -hmm. uh, physically, mentally, um, so it wouldn't be such a shock. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, I would definitely join the Marines again. And, uh, you know, I, I remember when I was enlisting, I was signing the paperwork, and I read a paragraph that said, uh, as, a, um, as a member of the American military, um, I acknowledge that I may um, put my life on the line and mm -hmm. put myself in danger. I remember at the time, this is 2000. Pre-9-11. Pre yeah, this was uh, winter of 2000. I'm thinking, there hasn't been a war since, major conflict since Desert Storm, yeah. even that. Um, you know, what am I going to see? And there it is, nine, ten months later, yeah. we're at war. Mm -hmm. But the fact that you said, you know, if you, no, even knowing what you know now, if you were a high school, you'd do the same thing. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I would do the same thing again. Hey, thanks for taking the time today. I, we Thank could you. go for another hour or two because I, I got a million <laughs> more questions, but I really appreciate, John, you sharing, and I know the Library of Congress does too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you very much, sir.